faculty. Um, let's go through what they call in, in NASA at, and what they will undoubtedly um, begin even as we speak as they preser preserve their data, that rather ominous statement coming out of uh, Mission Control, which you will recall, of course, from the uh, Challenger days, uh, the fault tree where they try to figure out what, how, what are they going to be looking at, try to help us prioritize how they would try to sift through this, what's happened here. I would assume that they all had data up until some moment, and there are various systems in which the failure could have occurred. It could have been in the control system. It could have been a failure in the hydraulics, as you mentioned. So uh, they'll have the experts in the various areas looking at their data to see if they can figure out what happened when. Uh, Norm, um, you, you were involved in um, Challenger and the investigation, were you not? I played some role in that. I was not on the, uh, the board that looked at it, but uh, I think most of us in the astronaut office wound up playing some role. And uh, among other things, I was a casualty assistance officer for the SCOBY family. I see. Give me, um, as we harken back to that as uh, the template for what goes on now, uh, first of all, th the first concern is the crew, clearly. Uh, search and rescue possibilities, chances of survivability. Let's run through that. Norm? Have we lost Norm? Norm Thagard? All right, we've lost Norm Thagard. I apologize for that. We'll try to get him back. All right, uh, it'd be nice if we could, um, if I could prevail upon the control room to uh, bring up some of the pictures of the crew at some point, on the, at least on the computer. And we're working on that right now, and we'll, we'll get that for you in just a minute. Seven-person crew led by Rick Husband uh, on his second flight. Uh, Willie McCool, his first, uh, David Brown, Kalpana Chala, Michael Anderson, Laurel Clark, and Ilan Ramon, the first Israeli to fly in space. And what we've been seeing, courtesy of uh, WFAA, our affiliate in Dallas, is uh, the unmistakable signs of a vehicle breaking up at an altitude of about 200,000 feet. Let's listen to James Hartsfield, Mission Control Houston, for a minute, if we can. Search and rescue teams in the Dallas-Fort Worth area have been alerted uh, to the shuttle contingency. Any debris that uh, is located in the Dallas-Fort Worth area should be avoided and uh, may be hazardous uh, due to toxic substances uh, used as propellants on the shuttle. Also, uh, debris could be reported uh, to NASA. All right, there you have it. James Hartsfield, public affairs officer, sitting in the console there in... Um Mission Control in Houston, uh, giving some advice which we'd like you all to heed, please. Uh, if you're in that part of Texas and you see some piece of debris from the Space Shuttle Columbia, uh, we invite you to stay away from it. Call the local authorities, please. Barbara Starr with us at the Pentagon or in Washington, anyhow. Barbara, what do you have for us? Miles, we can now tell you that the Bush administration is about to convene what they call a domestic event conference. This will be an interagency conference between all domestic and military agencies that will be involved in the next step, whatever that may be. Uh, we can tell you we've spoken to some Pentagon officials this morning. There is a lot of distress about this situation. They are about, to, as we say, to convene a domestic event conference. This is what happens in the federal government when there is a serious uh, domestic event in the country. Uh, we can also tell you that there would be every expectation uh, as events unfold here that the North American Aerospace Defense Command in Colorado and the U.S. Strategic Command in Omaha, Nebraska will be uh, involved in whatever the next step is, uh, trying to reconstruct through their satellite and communication systems what may have happened here, working with NASA on that. Uh, events appear to be moving very rapidly, but we are told that this conference is about to take place shortly, and they will begin planning for whatever the next step may be. Miles? All right. Um, we will uh, be watching that. Barbara, keep us posted on that. Does that occur in the Situation Room at the White House? Well, these things typically, uh, being interagency, occur uh, across Washington. We expect it to be partially in the Situation Room, in the Pentagon's National Military Command Center, and in other key government agencies. They are capable of conducting these conferences, not only by secure telephone, but by secure video phone. And 
Barbara, uh, Barbara, I'm going to have you pause for a minute. Let's listen to James Hartfield for one minute. Listen, listen. As a communications was lost with the Space Shuttle Columbia during its descent from orbit en route to landing at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, the last communications with Columbia occurred at about 8 a.m. Central Time as it was above the north central Texas area at an altitude of approximately 200,000 feet. Any debris that is located in the vicinity of the north central Texas area that uh, may be related to the shuttle contingency should be reported to local law enforcement who will then uh, report to NASA. It should be avoided. Uh, debris could be potentially hazardous due to toxic substances that are used as propellants on the space shuttle. Flight controllers here are securing all information and notes and data pertinent to the scheduled descent and landing of the shuttle today as part of contingency procedures. Search and rescue teams in the Dallas-Fort Worth area have been alerted. We are listening to James Hartsfield, Public Affairs Officer for NASA in Houston. And if you're just joining us... Any debris that is located in the north central Texas uh, vicinity that may be related to the space shuttle contingency should be reported to local law enforcement authorities and should be avoided as it may be hazardous due to toxic substances that are used as propellants for the space shuttle. James Hartsfield in Houston. Uh, offering up um, a word of warning to those who might encounter debris from the Space Shuttle Columbia. And if you are just joining us, the picture you are seeing right now tells the story. 100 miles south of Dallas, Texas, at an altitude of 200,000 feet, the Space Shuttle Columbia, on its 28th mission, broke up in flight six times the speed of sound. Take a look at the crew just briefly, if you could. There's the commander, Rick Husband, Kaplan Achala, pilot Willie McCool, Michael Anderson, Ilan Ramon of Israel, Laurel Clark, and uh, finally, David Brown. Seven crew members on board the Space Shuttle Columbia. Let's go to a witness from Palestine, Texas, Bob Moulter, what did you hear? What did you see? Well, approximately 8.09 this morning, uh, the entire house started to shake. And living in close proximity to a railroad track, we thought pop and with chemicals traveling, I thought it might have been an explosion. So I walked outside and immediately saw this spiral, long spiral in the air. And it was headed in a southeast direction from where we're at. And the rumbling continued, uh, it, it was very intense, for approximately two minutes and then just stopped. And about that point, the trail disappeared down towards the uh, sunrise. Bob Moulter, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I've, been, I've got a lot of things going on here, but you didn't see, you just heard things. Is that accurate to say? No, we saw the spirals in the sky. Spirals, OK. There were spirals like a, uh, a high-flying jet, except it wasn't in a straight line. Right. And did you see multiple uh, targets, if you will, pieces? Yes, it was like a wide band. Yeah. It was moving, and I would say that, and of course, it was difficult to by looking up, but I would say within the spiral, it was, it was a wide wave as right. it was moving. It was not in a straight line. Right. Now, did you, did you have any sense of what was happening at that point? None whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, I, in fact, I uh, called my wife at work and asked her, you know, did you hear and feel that? And she said, yes. I said, did you see it in the sky? And she said, no. And she said, turn on the TV. So I turned on the local station. There was nothing there. Mm -hmm. so I immediately switched over to CNN, and within one minute, um, of course, you came up with the breaking news, and I realized what it was. Now, it did, what did you, exactly did you hear, Mr. Moulter? It would be a sound that would be very similar to a tornado, if you've ever experienced that. It's a very loud, intense roar, um, and it stays at a certain pitch. There was no variance in it whatsoever. And as I say, it was very loud, and it, it diminished as the trail continued further southeast. Um, but it was loud enough, and it was low enough, because as I say, this trail was extremely wide, um, that it, it shook the building completely, the house. And I would say that it shook the house for a good minute. And how close do you think it landed to where you are? Uh, it's difficult for me to say. As I say, it was headed southeast towards the horizon, and then I lost it um, into the sun. Yeah. All right, Bob Moulter, thank you very much for that. We appreciate it. Norm Thaggard back with us, veteran shuttle 
astronaut, a veteran of a, a long stay aboard the space station Mir. Uh, Norm, when last we spoke and we lost you, we were talking about using you know, Challenger as a template here as to what happens in the immediate aftermath of something like this. What's going on right now? I'm sure there's some disbelief, but the pictures and all the circumstances uh, tell you that, that you, you know what happened. And so everyone now uh, is being professional at NASA. They'll be looking at their systems, all of the flight controllers, and uh, they'll try and come up with a, 